again for giving us this wonderful opportunity to come together as a church family and together around your glorious word. Father, we put our faith in your word this morning above all things that it might enter our hearts and change us. For you say in this word that it never goes out void, but it always returns having accomplished your purpose. Accomplish that purpose in us this morning, Father, helping us to grow a little further toward the image of our Lord Jesus. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 28. If you're using a church Bible, that's page 1170. In last week's study of chapter 27, we read in verse 29... And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. You remember that last week? They put down four anchors. And I wanted to point that out because Fox News published an article September the 20th, 2019. I thought this was very interesting. I found it yesterday. And the article read like this. The Bible Archaeology Search and Exploration Institute believes that it has identified evidence of the shipwreck which occurred around 60 A.D. That is the shipwreck we were reading about last week. And they go on to say in the article, <clears throat> In Acts 27, Luke narrates the story of Paul traveling to Rome on a large Alexandrian grain freighter. This ship endured one of the worst storms in history, eventually shipwrecking off the coast of Malta. Luke's amazing details include everything from the vessel's nautical headings the type of storm, the ship's direction of drift, geographical landmarks on Malta, reef configurations, and even the depths of the seafloor. You remember when they were taking soundings? It's really amazing that Luke really did document so much information concerning that trip that they could use it today, you know, to find this. It goes on to say, the, uh, after calculating the only spot on Malta which matched the biblical description, the Institute verified the course of the ship's drift using a sophisticated computer system that is typically harnessed for, re for search and rescue operations in the waters around Malta. The end result of the, that computer program matched the course of drift as the Bible describes and revealed that the ship of Paul would have impacted on the southeast coast of Malta. The only bay which matched all the criteria in Scripture and computer findings was St. Thomas Bay. So can anybody guess where some local divers wound up finding four ancient Roman anchors? St. Thomas Bay. Isn't that something? They found four ancient Roman anchors in St. Thomas Bay. Actually found it in the 60s. Some local divers found it in the 60s. And, uh, but later on, more recently, that's why Fox News published this story because this institute went out there, calculates everything that was in the Bible to try to find out where the ship would have uh, shipwrecked, and it was St. Thomas Bay. And then lo and behold, somebody informs them that four ancient Roman anchors had been discovered there in the 60s by the locals. One of the anchors, if I'm not mistaken, is actually in a museum over there to this day. 
And of course, it's amazing. Malta today is like 93%, maybe higher, a percentage of Christians there. You know, it's incredible to find a society like that. 93, 94 something percent Catholic over there. And uh, they trace their heritage all the way back to the shipwreck of Paul. It's even become part of their culture to this day. They have, they have a, a great record of all that taking place there. So what an impact Paul had on that place. And we're reading about it today, almost 2,000 years later. Levi, show us that anchor up there. They took a picture of it when they were bringing them up from the seafloor. That's one of them right there. Now, it don't look that big in the picture, does it? But do you know that anchor weighs 2,000 pounds? One ton. They let down four of those. They let down four tons worth of anchor during that storm. But if you remember in the story last week, they cut them loose. You know, that's why they remained on the seafloor until they were found recently. So, let's pick up our story in Acts chapter 28, verse 1 this morning. It says, After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. That is, all of the 270, I forget, 270-something uh, people on board had made it to the island safely. Uh, verse 2 says, The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold couple of things to consider here now. It says they kindled a fire and they welcomed us all. Now how big did that fire have to be to warm 276 people from the ship? <laughs> you know, when you first read that, you're thinking about a little campfire, but it said they welcomed us all and they warmed us by this fire. It must have been more like a bonfire. Plus it says it was raining. Luke says it was raining, so it had to be a really big and hot fire to keep from uh, going out, you know, during the rain. Verse 3 says, When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Now verse 4, when it says the natives say justice has not allowed him to live, we have to keep in mind they didn't know the God of the Bible or the God of the Hebrews. These were a pagan people, these natives on this island. You know, even today in some islands, people can be kind of removed from the general public of the rest of the world, you know, from, from societies at large. Uh, not so much as they were back then. At this particular time, with travel being so limited, you know, in their case, just by ship, there were no airplanes or anything like that. Um, they probably didn't have very much contact with outsiders. And it was known at the time that they worshipped the Greek gods because they had been influenced by Rome. Rome ruled the known world at the time. So it's interesting when it says these natives have this sense of right and wrong. They look at Paul and they see the viper. Because this snake didn't just bite him. The scripture says it fastened itself and it hung on him. So, and they knew this snake was poisonous. And their first reaction is... Justice. This man has escaped the sea, but now justice has not allowed him to live. He's going to die of a snake bite. Now that's really something, isn't it? A lot of times we as Christians kind of look at things that way, like, you know, if there's trouble, there must be a reason. But it's what's so interesting is the fact they don't know God. All they know is Greek mythology. And, but it could be that at that particular time they were referring to, say, Dyke, for instance. This was a Greek goddess, supposedly the daughter of Zeus. And in Greek mythology, the goddess named Dyke was the justice goddess. She was supposedly the goddess of all justice and moral order in the earth, human justice. So that's the only thing they had known when it comes to justice, as far as there being any higher power out there regulating right and wrong. So when we stop and think about it, how is it that pagans, in cases like this, for Paul said they showed us unusual kindness. They welcomed us in. They built fires. They were good people to Paul and these folks. Showing hospitality. Why would they go to such lengths, these pagans? And I would submit to you that we'd have to go back, we'd go to Romans chapter 1 to read a passage here to get the answer. 
course, Romans is our next book of the Bible that we'll be going into after Acts here, so maybe this is a good segue. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 through verse 20 says, in the New Living Translation, they know the truth about God because He has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. See, folks, if you think about it, that's the very reason that all cultures today that don't know the true one God of the Bible have invented religions and given themselves deities to venerate and to worship because they know there's something out there. Paul says it right here. You know, even though they don't... They may not have the law of God like the Jews did. They didn't have the Scriptures. But Paul says here in Romans chapter 1 that really God's divine nature, that is the nature of right and wrong, His laws of good and evil, that they're obvious to man because of His creation. That humankind can look around in the world and, and they can see the birds singing and the bumblebees creating honey and all these things that, you know, that go on in the earth. They see the animals you know, giving birth to their little ones and then guarding over them, trying to protect them. And they see even in nature, you know, the animal kingdom, how they, they feed the little ones until they grow up on their own. And, and we even have in our heart you know, the conscience, a spark of divinity there that tells us right from wrong. You know, without the Scriptures, our conscience only goes so far in knowing right from wrong. But it is the most fundamental and rudimentary source of right and wrong that God has placed there from the beginning. But according to Paul, they know by creation that there's something there regulating these things. There is a divine force there that gives them an idea of right and wrong. Paul says they really have no excuse. Now you can go on reading in Romans and he will tell you, he will further expound on that, saying that people suppress the truth with their wickedness. That is to say, a lot of people are deceived today. and They do wicked things and they don't seem to know right from wrong in a lot of cases. But according to Paul, it's because evil people are in the world suppressing the truth and promoting lies and deception. So a lot of, you know, simple-minded people get caught up in that. You know, and even a lot of smart intellectual people get caught up in it. You know, don't think just because somebody's educated, that means they're wise. Wisdom and education are two entirely different things. Wisdom comes from God. Wisdom comes from living. Knowledge can be taught in a book. Very different. This morning, I'll mention this before I move on. There's really two sources. There's three sources of the knowledge of the law. We have three primary sources of the knowledge of God's law in the world. First, it is our conscience. And I remind you today, the conscience is two words. It's kind and then science which means with knowledge. So when we sin and we feel our conscience pricked, it means we've done something wrong with knowledge. We knew better. And that's your first source of right and wrong, the law of God. It's in your conscience. He's written it on our hearts. The second place is the law of the state. You know, in every civilized nation today, no matter who they worship or what's happening there, in every civilized country today, they have laws which basically comes from a collective conscience of people who come together and they all mirror to some degree most of the rules in the Ten Commandments, you know, concerning murder and theft, these kind of things. It's illegal pretty much everywhere you go. See, the law of the state. So you have the law of the conscience, you have the law of the state, and then you have the third, which is the law of God, the divine law which we find in Scripture. So Paul says man is without excuse. He's really without excuse today. Everywhere we turn, the law of God is right there in our face. Whether it's our conscience, whether it's the laws of the land we're breaking, whether it's the divine law being preached from the pulpits and written in the Word of God. We know better. So Paul says we're without excuse. This is why we get in trouble. So after Paul was bitten by the poisonous viper, verse 5 says, He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> 
This is a good place to be reminded that we don't need to seek the approval and praise of people. You know, the adulation of people, the affirmation of people, the praise of people, it can be very fickle. At first, you know, he's a murderer. A few moments later, he's a god. Of course, for most of us today, it's the other way around. We start out in people's favor until we disappoint them or we don't live up to their expectations. And next thing we know, we're a devil. I know, I've had them call me such. I've had them praise me on one hand and a few days later I didn't live up to their expectations and they've called me devils, a false prophet, you name it. They had all kind of names for me. So people can be fickle today. Verse 7 says, Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island. His name was Publius. Who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with a fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, healed him. A dysentery, that's a word you don't hear very often. That's an intestinal uh, infection. You know, you heard probably in history how that lots of soldiers would get dysentery. It's because of lack of sanitation. A lot of times you can get it from drinking bad water. Verse 9 says, And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. Now what a bunch of nice folks, huh? Now Paul, he really stirred things up, you know, when he wasn't killed by the viper. And the next thing you know, and of course I'm kind of filling in some of the blanks here, but... They're all stirred up and they're looking at Paul with, with great reverence suddenly. Of course, I'm sure if anybody verbalized Paul's deity, he told them right quick there was just one and true living God they should be worshiping. But he got their attention. The next thing you know, he cures the chieftain there on the island. He cures his father. And that really raised the temperature. And now they're bringing people to him like they used to Jesus. And he's laying his hands on the sick. And he's healing them. And I want to point out something here that I noticed, and that is two of the five miracle signs that follow believers has happened here. Paul has operated in two of the signs. Remember, Jesus said over Mark chapter 16, verse 17 through 18, uh, he says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Notice there, the poisonous snakes won't harm them, Jesus said. And they'll lay their hands on the sick, and they'll recover. That's what Paul did here. He had a poisonous viper latch on to him. So the great sign that Jesus said would follow believers happened right there. Paul was not harmed by it. And next thing you know, he's laying his hands on the sick. So at least two of those five signs, just like the Bible said, they accompanied Paul. Now, and I'll say this real quick, I won't spend long here, but you know there's some strange uh, Pentecostal denominations in America today that take this scripture out of context. And they actually, instead of the sign accompanying them, they bring the signs into the four walls and try to make them happen, like they bring snakes in there. You've heard of snake handlers. Those are, they're a small, you know, sect, usually up in the mountains uh, of Pentecostals, and they do that. I've seen documentaries on it. I've seen a guy who had been bitten several times, talked about one of his family members who had died. Uh, the interviewer asked him, has anybody ever died from this practice? And he was like, yeah. And he went on to tell about a family member who died from the snake bite. But he himself had been bitten many times, been sick from it, and they feel like that they have to put these signs to the test. But, you know, to me, it's just common sense. Jesus was saying these signs will accompany you. In other words, when you do your missionary work, your evangelism, when you go out to spread the gospel, these signs will go with you. See, in the, in the New King James Version, it renders it like this, and these signs shall follow them that believe. And, of course, accompany is a similar word. You can't accompany someone unless they're going somewhere. You can't follow someone unless they're traveling. He said these signs will follow, they will accompany. Just like Paul, Paul is on the move, he's spreading the gospel. Therefore, these are signs. They shall be a sign, the Bible says. See, 
two people that don't know God. And it worked perfectly. We see an example of it right here. Why did the Lord say you'll take up snakes? I've heard people ask that. Like, well, that's a strange sign. Why did they say that? Well, snakes were common at that time in this part of the world. They were very prevalent. People got bit by them all the time. People died. You know, this was a common danger in those days. So Jesus was saying, look, when you get to moving out there spreading the gospel, you know, I know you're going into these foreign countries and places where there's, there's a lot of snakes and a lot of danger, but it's not going to harm you. You know, and if you drink something poison, in other words, the water's bad or something you eat there, you'll be okay. The Lord was saying, you go out there and spread the gospel. I'll be with you to protect you and I'll give you signs, you know, that will get the people's attention to let them know who the true and living God is. So today I remind you that though we can receive a miracle, no doubt, I've done it, my family's here, they, they know it's true. We've received healings and, and things like that in our family. We should believe for that. But primarily speaking, these signs were for those who were going out there in the mission fields. And even today, if you look it up, you will find there's many missionaries that testify to the speaking in tongues and prophesying and healings and miracles while they're out there in foreign fields talking to natives that didn't know the Lord. The Lord shows up and works the miraculous. Because you remember on the day of Pentecost, speaking in tongues wasn't making some strange sounds like you hear in some churches today. They spoke known languages. When they spoke in tongues, they were speaking somebody's language. And once again, it was a sign because the people knew that these people didn't speak that language. So now they believed in God. It's like, hey, you're speaking Chinese and you're from America. We know you don't speak that language. It must be God. You know, that was happening on the day of Pentecost. And it continued to happen with the missionaries as they would go in places where they couldn't speak the language. God would grant a miracle and they may start preaching in another language. I don't know about you guys, but I've read it on more than one occasion. I've uh, read stories, people testify as eyewitnesses how that out in the mission fields today they were present when all of a sudden their preacher started speaking in another language, speaking in tongues, and then after the service, some native would come to them and said, I didn't know you spoke that language. And he was like, I didn't either. <laughs> I didn't know I spoke that language. And they were like, well, you were speaking my native language fluently. So that's real, genuine speaking in tongues. You know, a lot of these things get misused, you know, in churches. And I know a lot of folks, they mean well. You know, I don't feel bad at them, but they don't know any better, I guess, in some cases. Anyway, verse 11 says, After three months we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, and the twin gods as a figurehead. That is, it had these twin gods on the front of the ship. Putting in, a, putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprung up, and on the second day we come to Putilio. Putilio. <laughs> Believe it or not, I looked this up to see how to pronounce it and I have forgotten already because I hate to come here and just make up pronunciations. I want to pronounce it correctly. This is uh, Putioli. That's it. I just heard the guy's voice in my head who gave the pronunciation this morning. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome and a pious and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier that guarded him. In verse 16, it says Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier that guarded him. This is why you hear Bible teachers sometimes speak of Paul being under house arrest. How many of you heard that statement before? And have you ever wondered when you heard that? What's going on there? In biblical times, they had house arrest. Because we have house arrest today. But today, you know, they accomplish house arrest by strapping an ankle bracelet on you, you know, with a monitoring system. There's some electronics involved and batteries. And they know if you leave the premises. Um, but they didn't have that back then. So it sounds strange, but now you see right here, it says Paul, he was allowed to stay by himself. Uh, that is, he wasn't put in the common prison with all the other prisoners. He got to stay in some housing by himself only with one soldier that guarded him. So Paul had obviously, once again, had favor. He found favor with these Romans every time he 
come in contact with him, especially the centurions. You know, he found favor with them and they were always helping Paul, rescuing Paul. They saw something there. They recognized the integrity in this man. They knew this man wasn't just some religious nut. And they knew religious nuts, believe me. You know, Rome dealt with that all the time. They dealt with religious zealots in that day who were very dangerous. But they saw something different with Paul. And of course, we know that it was God. God was protecting Paul until he could complete his mission. It's like I've said before, you know, until your mission in this earth is accomplished, you're invincible. You know, we may get scared sometimes. Going down the road, we get in some bad traffic, somebody's driving crazy, something happens, you know, you get all nervous. My wife's smiling because she knows this happens to her often. She gets real nervous. And, and I, But the thing is, until we accomplish our purpose, until we fulfill the mission that God gave us, we're invincible. Nothing is going to happen to us to stop that. Remember earlier when Paul was visited by the angel and the angel said, Hey, Paul, don't be afraid. You've still got to stand before Caesar. In other words, your mission's not complete. Don't forget you're headed to Rome. That's the goal. That's what you're, that's what you're called to do at this time. And you haven't gotten there yet, so why are you so afraid? Nothing's going to happen to you, not at least until you visit Rome and you've had a chance to stand before Caesar and preach the gospel. And it, of course it told us how that Paul took courage after that. Next thing you know, he's like captaining the ship. And, and you know, so to speak, not literally, but but anyway, in verse 17 it says, After three days, he, that is Paul, called together the local leaders of the Jews. Now he's settled into his house, he's under house arrest, he's with a soldier, but he's got the liberty, he's already sent out some flyers, you know. He, he he's he's made a few calls if there was such a thing. And he's getting together the leaders of the Jews. He's he's ready to have a minister's conference. It says, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Though I had no charge to bring against my nation, for this reason... Therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. Paul says it's because of the hope of Israel he's wearing a chain. Now, there, there again, there's, there's things in Scripture that if we don't slow down, we pass over and we don't really get it. Um, Paul's under house arrest. He's with a soldier, but it says he's wearing a chain. First of all, let's address what is he talking about when he says the hope of Israel. He says, for the hope of Israel, I'm wearing this chain. The hope of Israel was the hope of the Messiah. That's what he's talking about. To this day, Israel hopes in the Messiah. And they crucified Jesus because they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. And they're still waiting. So that's the hope of Israel Paul is referring to. And this is why Paul is an enemy to Israel at this time because he says, hey, your hope has been fulfilled in Christ. And they don't want to accept that. So now what's he mean when he says, I'm wearing this chain? Well, according to uh, scholars and historians, you know, that study Roman culture and all of that, they say that at that time it was, it was Rome's way that you were chained to the guard. This guard that was with Paul, it lived with Paul. Like I said earlier, he had a house of his own and the guard that he lived with there. The guard was with him. And see, they tell us that there was a chain hooked to the guard and to Paul. That's the way Paul had to live. And the, and the soldier had to be there too, chained to Paul, until Paul had his day in court and things were settled one way or the other. In which case he would have been put into the common prison or he would have been put to death or whatever. Now... I don't know, I've sat around and thought about it. Number one, we learned, because you may think that's, that's, that's something, you know. I mean, how could a guard stand to be chained to a prisoner all the time? But the same historians tell us that there were four shifts in these situations. Each guard only served six hours at a time. And then they would change shifts with another guard who would be then chained to the prisoner for their six-hour shift. So it wasn't 24-7. You know, guards got to switch it up. Of course, the prisoner didn't. 
he was chained to the guard 24-7. But, uh, of course, we know Paul well enough through this story to know he just found that to be a captive audience for him. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't doubt if all four of those guards were Christians by the time it was over. And I suppose that uh, the, the guards... The chain, you know, had to be long. I'm just speculating now, but I would think that it would have to be a long chain, you know, because Paul has to bathe himself. He has to go to the restroom, and uh, so they couldn't have been chained too close together. That just wouldn't have been uh, that wouldn't have worked out. It don't seem so. But anyway, it, it's a rough situation to live in. But I mean, Paul made the best of it. He's having meetings in the house. He's calling together groups of people. He's preaching. So. He found a way to live his life in these conditions. Verse 21 says, And they said to him, <clears throat> Excuse me. Now these are the Jews answering Paul, the Jewish leaders. We have received no letters from Judea about you. And none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they say sect, once again, they're referring to Christians, believers. Verse 23 says, When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. Sounds like Paul has a house full now. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Now when they say the law of Moses, they're always referring to the law and the prophets. The law of Moses is the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then the prophets, you know, you've got the, mi the major prophets, the minor prophets, you've got the prophetic utterances of King David in the Bible. You know, all of these are considered the prophets as to the writings. Verse 24 says, And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. Now this is the statement he made that caused them to depart. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Verse 30 says, And he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now in verse 24, some were convinced by Paul, it says, but others disbelieved. It's still that way today. I mean, that's the final analysis of everything. As I preached this morning, there may be somebody who goes out of here that doesn't believe. You know, some will believe. Everywhere that I've ever preached, I could perceive at times. Sometimes I knew exactly who believed and who didn't believe. I don't always know, but sometimes you know. Sometimes God gives you perception in the moment and you can pick it up. You know, some believe and some don't believe. The Bible tells us over in the New Testament, in the writings of Paul, that one time Paul preached and it said, to as many as were preordained unto eternal life, these believed. But it said the rest did. In other words, that's the way it is, Paul was saying. Those who are predestined to eternal life, those to whom God has seen through the telescope of time that they belong to Him, they're going to believe. For the Bible speaks of a day when we're called. You know, as many as He did foreknow, the Bible says He predestinated them to be conformed to the image of His Son. And those He predestined, it said He called. Those He called, He justified. And those He justified, He eventually glorified. That is, they received the new body, the change of the body. So it tells us in that, that everybody preordained, they're going to come to a day when they're called. See, how does that happen? Through the Word. God sent somebody, like He sent Paul all the way to Rome to teach these people. And some believed. That was their day of calling. They were being called that day. 
And they responded by believing. But some didn't believe. Why? Because they weren't even called. See, the call didn't go out to them. He said right here, their ears are dull, their eyes are closed. He said, lest they should hear and perceive, and I heal them. In other words, this has happened to them and they're not going to be healed as to salvation. You know, why does it say this about the nation of Israel? Why did He say these people have become dull in their heart and they can barely hear now with their ears and their eyes are closed? He wasn't talking about natural ears. They all had natural ears and they could hear just fine. You know, unless they had some kind of problem. He's talking about spiritual ears. You know, the Bible speaks of it like this. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In every age, God speaks through the ministry around the world. And everybody has a measure. You know, I have a measure. You have a measure. Everybody that shares the gospel has some measure of the voice of God working and operating through them to call people to repentance. See, but every generation, the call goes out, you know, to come and repent. So why did He say this about Israel? Why did He say their hearts were dull? Well, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1 says it like this, He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. One rendering says he'll suddenly be destroyed without remedy. He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck he will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. He'll suddenly, he will suddenly be broken, Paul says, without any healing. There won't be any healing. There'll be no recovery, the Bible tells us. Now this is what happened to the Jews at the time, the nation of Israel, other than the remnant. The Bible teaches that with every, every nation of people, there's a remnant. You know, same goes for churches. There's remnants in the church. The remnant are those who are saved. Every group of people has a remnant that God has preordained that will hear the gospel, that will respond appropriately, that will be saved. And he had a remnant in Israel. Paul talks about that in other books of the Bible. But here we find that this is what happened to Israel. They were often reproved. Remember Jesus, how He stood before Israel before they crucified Him? What did He say? He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone every wise man I send to you. How often would I have gathered you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks? He said, but you would not. Therefore, your houses are now left to you desolate. And they'll remain that way until you can say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, till you have a change of heart, a change of attitude, Jesus was saying. He said, how often I would have gathered you. But notice he said, you stoned every wise man that came to you. You killed the prophets, Israel. And what does Solomon tell us in the Proverbs? He who is often reproved. See, Israel was often spoken to, often reproved by the prophets, by the wise men. But they hardened their hearts. They wouldn't respond. And what happened? Paul says, now their ears are dull. They can hardly hear. See, it's like a miracle now to, to reach them with the gospel. Their spiritual ears are dull. They can't perceive the voice of God anymore. He said their eyes are closed. They can't see it anymore. And I just would want to leave us with that this morning. Even as Christians, we need to remind ourselves, don't let our hearts grow dull. You know, because we're often reproved. Every time we read the Word of God, there's, there's instruction. There's reproof. Remember what the Bible said about the Word? When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said the Word is good for reproof. It's good for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished or complete for every good work. So every time we hear the Word, we're being instructed. We're being reproved. It's often, if you're a churchgoer, it's often if you read your Bible every day and listen to it on the radio, it's often. I listen to it often every day, usually multiple times a day. And I'm reproved often. And every time, you know, I want to humble myself. We have to humble our hearts. Because if we begin to resist what we're hearing, we begin to resist the voice of the Lord. He says here that we'll become stiff-necked. We'll become hardened like Pharaoh over there. When Moses said God Himself hardened Pharaoh. 
because of Pharaoh's way, because of his outlook, because of his evil heart of unbelief, the Bible said God hardened him. God went ahead and shut him off where he couldn't possibly give in because he says, now I'm going to show my wonders. And he showed the ten plagues because he made Pharaoh's heart so hard. Pharaoh was like an insane man. I mean, all kinds of calamity was befalling Egypt. The Bible said until Egypt lied in ruins. Yet Pharaoh was so ignorantly hardened, he would not turn the children of Israel loose. But God hardened him and was determined to issue all ten plagues before Pharaoh came to any kind of wisdom at all. Finally, his people surrounded him, you know, his counselors, and they were like, turn these people loose, you know. We're, Israel is, is sitting in ruins now. What are we doing? And it wasn't until the death of the firstborn, which was even the death of one of Pharaoh's children. When the death of the firstborn happened, all of a sudden a light came on Pharaoh's head. He's like, I got to turn these people loose. They, they, maybe they do have a real and living God, you know. But if we keep a, a tender heart, you know, the Bible says, be tender hearted toward one another, love one another, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. I was telling uh, my wife this morning, I think I quoted that very verse, that we got to be tender-hearted toward one another, loving one another, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven us. That's what we should practice. See, if we do that, if we practice humility and love toward one another, we won't resist the reproof and the instruction of His Word, will we? And that way we won't become hard-hearted. And we'll always be open, and God will always be able to bless us and to help us and ultimately save us from the wrath to come. Because I remind you, there is a day of wrath coming. And according to the signs of the time, I believe we're closer than ever to it. It could just be right around the corner. Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour, but you would know when it was close, even at the door. He says, for you can discern the face of the weather, Jesus said, by looking at the sky. You know what it's going to do the next day. He says, but you stand there and tell me you can't discern the signs of the time. Jesus said, you're a generation of hypocrites. And we don't want to be that today. I feel like I can see the signs of the time. And I bet a lot of you do too. You can tell the coming of the Lord is close at hand. See, and when He comes, He says, I'll come with reward for some and wrath for others. We want to, we want to have a clear conscience when He comes. And be excited when that day begins to unfold. You know, it's sad for the world, yes, but it's an exciting day for His children because He's going to rescue us from the wrath to come. Amen. Do you believe the Word of the Lord this morning? Amen. Can we give Jesus the hand clap? Praise the Lord. We'll get the musicians to come back up this morning and send us off with a song. bow our heads if we could this morning and we will go to the Lord in prayer as they begin to play the music this morning and uh, let's just humble our hearts before the Lord repent of our mistakes this week, our trespasses our sins, our weaknesses repent before the Lord because I remind you, He said if we'll do this you know, He'll give us a clean slate He'll forgive us and cleanse us, John said, from all unrighteousness. There's nothing more valuable than a clear conscience today. I'm telling you, nothing more valuable. It's, apologies are hard to come by sometimes. They're hard to, to make. You know, I admit it. It's one of the hardest things for me to do is apologize. But I think I'm getting better at it. I'm trying. Because sometimes that's the only thing that will clear your conscience when you know you're wrong. You don't want to sweep it under the rug. You may forget it, but it doesn't go away. The conscience knows. Heavenly Father, as we close this service, we just want to say that we love you today and we believe your word. We believe that it's powerful. As your word says, we're not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. We believe it, Lord, so that we know that it's your power of salvation in our life. Help us, Lord, to receive it, 
Let it go into our hearts and change us. Let it empower us, Father, and embolden us to go out there into the world to fulfill the mission for which you've called us. That there might be, as Paul said, one day a crown of righteousness laid up for us on the other side. Father, I pray that you would bless each and every person who came today. Bless their loved ones. Watch over the children. Bless us as we go to our responsibilities this coming week. Help us to fulfill those responsibilities with integrity. Help us to do right, Lord, to build a good reputation so that our future would be bright. Bless us, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. Bring us all back together again next week and allow us once again to gather around your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.